You know, I was one of the first ones on my block to have a home computer. And over the years, it served me well in many ways. Uh, the way I write, being able to write on a computer and, and re-edit and things has been a, a real help for me in writing sermons and letters to people and things like that. But then I also remember how much time I've probably wasted on the computer in my life. And, and, and I wonder, is, was it really a good thing? Today, we're going to wrestle with technology as part of our spiritual lives. We may think that our spiritual lives are divorced from technology around, but in fact, technology impacts us and the way we live our lives impacts how we use technology. And I hope it's a blessing for you today. My name is Murray Richmond, and I'm pastor of the First Presbyterian Church here in Medford, Oregon, and we thank you for worshiping with us, and we pray that God blesses you through this worship service today. Let's join our hearts in the call to worship. Give thanks to the Lord, for God is good. God's steadfast love endures forever. Let our words and thoughts be acceptable to God. The Lord is our rock and our redeemer. Let us worship God.
first lesson this morning is found in Genesis, the 11th chapter, verses 1 through 9. Now the whole earth had one language and the same words. And as they migrated from the east, they came upon a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. And they said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and fire them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and bitumen for mortar. Then they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens. And let us make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we shall be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. The Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the mortals had built. And the Lord said, Look, they are one people and they have one language. And this is only the beginning of what they will do. Nothing that they propose to do will now be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and confuse their language there so they will not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of all the earth, and they left off building the city. Therefore it was called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth, and from there the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of all the earth. gospel lesson comes to us this morning from the book of Matthew, uh, chapter 7. Again, this is part of the Sermon on the Mount. Um, Hear the word of the Lord. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and acts on them will be like a wise man who built his house on a rock. The rain fell, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on the house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against the house and it fell and great was the fall. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So a bunch of computer scientists got together and they asked their computer, is there a God? And the computer responds by saying, not enough data to process question. So they become intrigued. And so they get other people with other computers, and they hook them all up, and they ask the question, is there a God? And the computer comes back and says, not enough resources to answer the question. So now it's becoming a quest for them. So they contact all the major universities in the world and they get them to hook their mainframes up together. And then they type in, is there a God? And the computer again responds, not enough resources to answer the question. So now they're really going to go after this thing and they make it a public thing. And they get everybody that's got a personal computer to hook their computers in with all the mainframes, and they type in, is there a God? And again, the answer is, not enough resources to answer the question. So now the whole world wants to know what's going on, and so they want to know the answer to this, and so they get every computing device that you can imagine, and they manage to work it in so that they're all hooked up 
to this one computer and they ask that computer the question, is there a God? And the computer answers, there is now. Technology. That's the ongoing process of things that change our world. Technology is about things. A phone is a thing. But technology is not just modern technology. A book is a part of technology. Um, An organ is part of technology. But they're all things. Now, I have a pretty strong relationship with my computer. I spend a lot of time on it every day, writing and looking up things and all that. But it is still a thing. But technology surrounds us and it surrounds almost everything we do. There's so much involved. And technology has gotten so advanced now that I think when we look at the everyday practices of spiritual lives, we need to open ourselves up to look at the technology around us. Because this is such a large part of our lives that if we can't fold our spiritual lives into it somehow, then maybe something's missing. And with technology, I think we'll find that that is probably the case. Technology is neither good nor bad. It's, it just is. The technological advances are neither good nor bad. It's the way we use them that makes them either good nor bad. So, for instance, I have a phone. And with this phone, I can be in touch with anybody else that has a phone. And that's a great thing. Of course, the downside is... I'm never out of touch with anybody, and I've always got my phone, and anybody can get me at any time. And how much time do we spend playing on our phones when we're going out to eat or things like that? But then look at all the ways that technology has affected our worship services here. We've got the organ and the piano. Both of those were technological advances. We have a book which was a technological advance with the the advent of the printing press. We have electric lights. We have heat in here. We've got a microphone. At our first service, we have a PowerPoint. And in this service, you guys are watching it at home because we have cameras and microphones and all sorts of things. You know, this, this... is part of our lives. You know, I, 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 I woke up this morning and it was my phone, my alarm on my phone that woke me up and I drove a car to get to work and I wrote the sermon on a computer and I'm using this pad here to read the sermon and to remind myself of what I was going to say. And as a matter of fact, um, I used an electric thing to boil the water for the coffee that I had this morning, although I did use my great grand grandfather's hand crank wooden coffee grinder to grind it up and I used a French press but even those were advances of technology somebody was grinding coffee with a stone and said there's got to be a better way to do this and they found a better way to do it and for you people watching at home you know we're reaching out to you through the means of technology now most of us would agree that the things that I have mentioned the organ the piano the book the lights the heat and the fact that you can watch this at home are good things but we have to understand that not all technology is always good even if it purports to be I have a app on my phone that's it's a prayer app it does my it has my daily devotions on it But I don't use it that much because I found when I was using it, I was also going and checking my email and I get an alert about this from something and I find I got an email about this and I get a phone call and all of a sudden I'm not doing my devotions, I'm playing on my phone. Um, And when I use the older technology of a book, I find it's easier for me to be more focused. Which means that When we approach technology, we have to look at what we want it to do for us and what it can do for us. The Old Testament lesson is the story of the Tower of Babel. And in it, you know, people wanted to build something that would go up to heaven. And we see, actually see the development of their technology. They said to one another, let us make bricks and fire them thoroughly. Making of bricks is a technological advance you know, they first they lived on a plane, and now let us build a city and a tower. In order to do these things, you have to have technological knowledge. You can't just go out and build a tower. You've got to know how to do it so it won't fall. 
Now here's where the story, story starts to change a little bit. And they built a tower with its top in the heavens. They said, let us build a tower with its top in the heavens and let us make a name for ourselves. Now they've gone from what they can do technologically to what they think the technology can do for them. The technology can get them to heaven and they can make a name for themselves. They can be like gods. But it doesn't work. And if you dig deep into this and look at the language that the author uses here, you find it says, the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the mortals had built. And the words here are very important. First, the Lord came down from heaven to see the tower. Clearly, the tower did not reach to the heavens because God had to come down to see it. So while they were, had thought that they had built a tower that took them to the heavens, that took them to God, in fact, they were just fooling themselves. They had done no such thing. The tower did not bring them actually closer to heaven. As a matter of fact, the tower ends up alienating them from God. Now, God is upset. God says nothing that they propose, propose to do will be impossible for them. They're, they think they can do anything. But remember, they didn't actually succeed in building the tower to heaven. They just thought they did. And that's one of the major problems with technological advancements. We might think they make us better than we were before, but they don't. They might make us more comfortable they may make us healthier, and, and that's a good thing. They can bring more and more resources for us to read and study, but that doesn't make us smarter. We just think we're smarter, but we're not. We have more information at our fingertips, but information is not wisdom. And so the technology can trick us into thinking that we really have something that we don't have. The German scholar Rudolf Bultmann said famously, people cannot use electric lights and radios and in the age of illness take advantage of modern medicine and clinical means and at the same time believe in the spirit and wonder of the New Testament. And whoever intends to do so must be aware that they can profess this as an attitude of Christian faith only by making the Christian proclamation unintelligible and impossible for the present. Now, what Bultmann is, is really saying here is we have created a world for ourselves where we don't need God. We, don't, we have essentially placed the wonder of God with the wonder of technology. You know, in the old days when Jesus healed people, the crowds were awed and they saw it as a miraculous act of God. We see healing as, for the most part, an act of modern medicine. And God has little or nothing to do with it. The pills I take for my high blood pressure doesn't come from God. They come from scientists and labs. Although it's not that clear cut. I was in my office one morning and uh, one of my parishioners came in. This was when I was in my church in Alaska. And he was a doctor in the ER and his wife was having surgery that day. And he came in and he said, I need you to pray for her. And, and then he said something real interesting as, a, as an ER doctor, as someone who works with people in medical crises, I know how much of what we do is dependent on God. It's not just the technology that saves people. It's the skills of the doctor. And then there's this thing that he said, whenever he's working on a patient, there's a place where God comes in and is a part of that process. The technology does not get rid of God. Sometimes it just makes God harder harder to, to see, harder to comprehend. Now, as we wrestle with technology and what it means in our lives, there's a great verse in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 12, that says, all things are permitted for me, but not all things are beneficial. All things are permitted for me, but I will not be dominated by anything. And that gives us a good handle on how, as Christians, how, as spiritual people, we can approach technology. The first is, just because it's there doesn't mean we have to use it. In the movie Jurassic Park, a group of people are discussing the technology used to clone dinosaurs. And one person says, yeah, yeah, but your scientists were so preoccupied with whether or not they could do it, they never stopped to think whether they should do it. Just because we can do something doesn't mean that we should do it. 
And the answer to that question cannot come from what science and technology can teach us. It can only come from our conscience, from our prayers, from our relationship with God. That is a moral decision. And science and technology aren't equipped to handle moral issues. Now, some people believe that the Amish, for example, are against all technology. Well, maybe that was the way um, people think about it, but the way it was explained to me was that before they adopt a new technology, they have a process where they talk about whether or not this technology will be good for them or not. And they understand that just because it makes life easier, just because it provides more comfort, that does not mean that it is good for them to have that technology. Now, I have to admit when I I think about the Amish, and granted, there are different types of Amish with many different beliefs about which technology is good and which technology is not. But I think the people that don't use zippers yet can probably get over that one. But for instance, you know, they want to see how is this technology going to affect us at people? If we, 20 years ago, we could be shown how the internet would have affected our society if we had a peek into the future and could see what the internet would do for us, both the good and the bad, I wonder if we would embrace it as enthusiastically as we have had over the years. Um, We don't really have a process to ask those kinds of questions. You know, I remember back in the 90s before cell phones were really prolific here, I was traveling and I was in Finland and, and I was in a, in a restaurant. And Finland was about 10 years ahead of us on cell phone technology at that time. And everybody had a cell phone and everybody's sitting in this restaurant talking on their cell phones. And they're sitting across from someone and the, both the people at the table are talking on their cell phones. Now, I don't think they were talking to one another, but it, it just it, it, I looked at that and I wonder... How is it that people relate when they're so busy in their phones? You know, you you go to a restaurant today and you see two people sitting there and they're both got their noses in their phones playing with that and they're not paying attention to one another. And, you know, seeing that, I remember asking myself, is cell phone technology really a good thing? And when smartphones came out, I began to wonder, is that also a good thing? Another aspect of technology is that all technology will have an upside and a downside. For example, we made the decision to go online with worship services when COVID hit. Now, on the one hand, I feel a little uncomfortable with that. And I know for you watching at home, um, you know, that, that we're, it, that this is very important to you. But worship was never really meant to be a solo activity. We're meant to do it together with other people. We're meant to commune with one another and we get more out of our relationship with God when we worship with others than we do worshiping alone. So, you know, there's a sense where we're offering people the ability to worship online, but is it really the kind of worship that draws them closer to God in the same way that public worship can do? On the other hand, though, there are people who are at home and they, can, they are not able to get out. They have a compromised immune systems or they have other health issues and they're not able to get out. And so through technology, they're able to access, you are able to access the worship service. It's not all good and it's not all bad. And we have to wrestle with both sides of implications. So as, as we're looking at different forms of technology in our lives, one thing that's important to do is to look at the downside of it and then ask ourselves, is the downside worth it? Now, in this case, we decided that it was. It was important for people to be able to have access to a worship service, even though it's not the best possible way to access worship. Another question we need to ask is, how does our technology affect our relationship with God? And that is the $64,000 question. I mentioned I have a devotional app on my phone and I told you I don't use it very much because that using my phone tends to draw me away from God where when I'm using a book, I tend to focus in more. And so I don't use the technology available to me when I do my morning worship. Um, It's very important sometimes also to take a break from technology. 
A few weeks ago when I talked about food, I talked about the, the, the idea of fasting and how you know, one of the spiritual practices when it comes to how we deal with food is to fast, to abstain from food. And I think with technology, that's a very good idea. Can you go a whole day and not use your smartphone? Can you go a week without TV? Can you not use your car but walk to places that are nearby? Can you go a week without fast food, choosing instead to eat slow food? Can you listen to live music instead of a CD or the radio or, or whatever it is that you listen to? And finally, I, I use the text about Babel because there's a danger that we believe technology will solve all of our problems. And while technology can solve many problems, it can also create new problems. One of my colleagues at seminary did a paper on how all the labor-saving devices that have accumulated over the years have actually created more labor for people rather than less. They aren't necessarily labor-saving devices. And she gave us an example out of her own life. She said when she was growing up and her mother cooked dinner, that her mom cooked one thing for everybody. Everybody got the same meal. And if you didn't like it, you didn't eat. But with all the microwaves and, 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 and instant foods and things like that in the house, she has a house full of where she has many foster kids. And each of the kids has a different meal because they're all so picky. They want something. And she has the technology to make a different meal for everyone. But in the end, it creates more work for her rather than less. And yes, every kid gets the meal he wants. But is life always about getting what we want all the time? It is not. Technology has created a world where it seems like we don't need God. We flip a switch and we get a light. We drive to the store and we get food. We get sick and we take a pill that makes us better. We feel down and we can go to the pharmaceutical industry and they've got a drug that'll make us feel happy. It would be easy to believe that technology has replaced God. We don't need God anymore. You know, food's going to get to us. We don't need to pray to the gods for rain and things like that. But ask another question. Has technology made us more loving? Has technology made us more caring? Has technology helped us get in touch with our inner selves more so than we could before? And in all these cases, the answer is no. I can reach out across the world and email someone, but does that mean that what I say to them is going to be something godly, something loving and caring, something that exhibits my Christian faith to them? In fact, I think you could make the case that the rise of the Internet has led to many and more problems than it has solved. People can say things anonymously, and when they do, we found people can say some pretty hateful things. Technology cannot change the human heart. It cannot make us better people. It can only make us more comfortable. It can't even make us happy. It can just take away some of the problems we had. And that's not always a good thing. Now, there are other ways where technology is wonderful. I, for one, am a fan of Novocaine. If I'm having my teeth worked on, I want the doctor to have the technology of being able to numb my mouth when he works on me. But being comfortable is not the be-all and end-all of life. While technology makes it easier, for example, for me to look up information, it also makes it easier for me to get distracted at all the information out there. Technology made it easier for the Nazis to kill more Jews. And that's not a good thing or for people to get weapons of mass destruction. You know, I'm a big fan of the TV show Star Trek. And I've watched the many different iterations it's got in the movies, and I love it. And, and they create this future world where technology is this great good and everything's fine. But Star Trek is a fantasy. It's a fantasy. And it assumes that the human heart has become radically better what, because of the technology or because of the passage of time? I'm not sure. The human heart stayed roughly the same for most of our existence. And it, it's, it, it's a lie that this technology can lead us to this paradise. 
We cannot escape technology, and we shouldn't try to escape technology. It is, it's not in inherently bad, but it's not all inherently good. It's what we do with it that counts. We can use technology to further our love of God and loving our neighbor, or we can use it to try to build a new Tower of Babel, in which case we don't need God, and we end up just confused. Jesus told a story at the end of the Sermon on the Mount that I read. You know, last week's hurricane, Ian, ravaged parts of the eastern seaboard from Florida to the Carolinas, and all the tech in the world couldn't stop that storm. You could have had the smartest of smart homes, electronic and automatic everything, and in the end, your house is still flooded just like everybody else's. The technology may be a big part of your house, but it does not make a home. When the storms of our lives come, all the technology in the world can't save us. But if we build our lives on something solid, on something that can sustain us and can sustain our souls, build our lives on receiving and giving the love of God to others, build our lives in carrying out God's will so we know what our purpose is in life. None of those are technological advances. They've been with us for ages, and we make that choice whether we do it or not. If we build our houses on technology, the storms will come and wipe us away. But if we build our houses on the love of God, then we can use technology to spread that love to other people. But it's what we base it on that's really important. So build your house, your technologically advanced smart home that's got every new gadget on the love of God and not on the technology itself. Amen. Will you please join me in prayer? O Lord, our God, through the centuries, you've given humans the ability to better the world for themselves and for others. And through the use of technology, we've done many things, many things that have made our lives better. Um, And we thank you for, for making us, for creating us in your image and so that we're able to create and we're able to do things. And and that we're able to come up with new ideas and new ways of doing things, and we thank you for that. But help us to always remember who is God and what is not, and that the things we surround us with, in many cases the things that control some parts of our lives, are not you. They are not you. And help us to remember to give our lives to you, to your love, to the way you reach out in love for others. And as we have tools that can help us do that, help us to use those tools well and wisely. But help us also to be aware of the dangers of what we have in our hands and to uh, beware and to avoid those as best we can. For in the end, it is, it is not who has the biggest and best computer or seen all the latest TV shows or stream, is able to stream everything they want to see, but it's... It's about how we love you and how much we know that you love us. So we just pray that you continue to draw us together as human beings, human beings who are capable of doing great things, but human beings whose hearts are important and for whom the way we reach out to one another 
is much, much more important than the means we use to reach out to one another. That reaching out in love is the best way no matter how we do it. As we reach out now to those who we care about, we pray for them and we lift those prayers up to you now. God, we ask for healing for Paula Burkhalder, who's now home after being hospitalized for irregular heartbeat. For Mike Grunwald, who's in the hospital and recovering from kidney stone surgery. For my sister-in-law, Naomi, in Prescott, Arizona, now in a, a coma, and I can't understand why. We're thankful, Lord, for things that Linda Campbell and family and friends have You've comforted them and brought a measure of peace upon Art's death. We thank you that Linda's family has been able to be there with her. We're thankful that Marv Hayes is feeling so much better, able to return to church and normal activities after hospitalization for his heart. And Lord, we're thankful that Sophia Marks was able to go to Eugene last week and is feeling stronger and was able to have fun and visit friends there. Mm -hmm. In all of these things, Lord, we, we realize that we are small, but we are loved by you. Our problems may seem insignificant to those of the, of the world, And yet you care for each and every one of us because you love us as your children. And as your children, we pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation but deliver deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. This is the part of the service where we ask you to give an offering to God. And while that can mean a financial offering, and we would appreciate uh, your, your gifts to help us keep this ministry going to you, it does cost money to have this equipment and to run a church so we can bring broadcasting uh, to you and bring the service to you. But I also want you to consider, what else can you give to God this week? Can you give God an hour of the time that you might have spent watching TV or playing on your phone or on your computer? Or can you commit yourself to using these tools to help you grow closer to God in a way and to explore how that can happen? What can you give to God this week out of your heart, out of your life? Oh, Lord, we thank you for all the gifts that we have and all the gifts that are given to us through, through, through you and your spirit, but also through the, the sharp minds of others who bring us things that can make our lives a little better, but at the same time help us to remember who our true God is and to turn to you, and we give you that which we can out of our hearts. Amen. You can't avoid technology in the world. There's no way to do it. And we shouldn't embrace it all. But finding that middle path, that's what we're called to do. And may you find that path where the technology serves you and you don't serve it. And may the love of God fall down upon you like a soft summer rain. May the grace of Jesus surround you like the air you breathe. And may the power of the Holy Spirit work in and through you now and forevermore. Amen. Thank you.